Hey friends, I'm Nari, and this is the Dr. Nari Jeter and the Prosper School Show. It's a podcast for students who want their best college life. As a professor, I've helped tens of thousands of students learn to balance success and fun in college. In this show, you'll hear from me and other guests on how college changed our lives and got us to where we are today. This is not a class lecture. This is a dose of motivation and inspiration just for you right where you are. I am so excited you're here. Let's get started. Hey friends, it's Nari with Dr. Nari Jeter in the Prosper School, and it's just me solo today, but I am really excited to do a book review with you. So this is the book Atomic Habits. Um, It's a book I've listened to quite a few times on audiobook, and I have the paper copy so I can take notes. And as the holidays are coming up, and I'm thinking maybe college students are heading home and want to get away from reading textbooks, I thought it would be a great read um, as far as just inspiration, personal development, and some very real applications to college. Let me tell you my philosophy on personal development books. So I read a lot of them. Um, I have since my college days. Um, Often I will read them with, you know, respect to maybe some phase or season I'm going to going through in my own life. Um, sometimes they're marriage books, sometimes they're child raising, um, and sometimes they're about things like goal getting or organizing or those types of things. I will say that if I could give any college student uh, a little piece of advice Um, about what can I be doing with my time when I'm not in school and I don't have to study to just make myself better, I would say read personal development books. Because at the end of the day, when you leave college, life isn't all about grades. Life is about growing as a person and about, you know, feeling ready to take on new things, being open-minded, um, being able to set and achieve goals. And so I think um, that personal development is its own skill set in and of itself. And I, in, in today's world, we have access to so many different books and worldviews and ways of looking at things. And one piece of advice, I always tell people, just because someone writes something in a book doesn't mean that it's going to work for you, and it doesn't mean that it's going to ring true for you and all your experiences. So I I use this expression, um, chew it up, but don't always swallow it. And what that means is, think about it. Think about if what the author is writing about, if that resonates for you or if that will work for you, but you don't have to absorb it as truth. Um, And so I read a lot of personal development books where some of it I really agree with and other parts I'm like, you know, that hasn't been my experience. Um, And so I'm just going to let that piece go, but it doesn't mean the book in and of itself isn't valuable. It just means that little bit of knowledge within the book just doesn't fit for me and that's okay. Um, But I will say that this book, um, and this is, I'm sorry, I should have said it's um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. This book um, really resonates with me uh, as an individual, as a teacher educator, and also as a marriage and family therapist. I work with um, clients all the time on working on making changes in their life. And a lot of the basic principles that James writes about in this book are things that are very basic to making changes in your life. Um, So the title of the book is called Atomic Habits. And the idea is atomic means tiny, um, but he's referring to tiny changes lead to big results. And and I don't want to spoil the book for you, so I'm not going to go through the entire book, but I did want to do a a review of it um, with college students in mind and some things that if you take the time to read the book, I want to point out to you as a college professor and college success coach that I think um, is really important. Now, what I love about this book, honestly, is that um, James is uh, his own personal journey with changing his habits started in college. So um, right there, as I was listening to this book, I thought, oh, my gosh, like 
this is, you know, really um, a book that even though it's, I think, marketed towards, and I know a lot of like adults my age have read it, I thought this is valuable for college students because he started to notice that if he made a small change or gave attention to one detail in his life and really focused on that, he saw some great dividends and payoffs for that and then transferred that attention to maybe something else. So he he talked about paying attention to like his exercise habits and what he was eating and lifting and about how when he really gave that attention, he saw growth. And then when he transferred that to keeping his room clean or transferring that to his study habits, again, it wasn't like he just what all of a sudden one day woke up and said, I need to eat better, um, lift heavier, have a cleaner room and um, do, you know, do better in school. It was just small changes he was starting to make. And it, it in my mindset is when you build the confidence to make those small changes of in one area of your life you can then just generalize that to another area of your life. So that's kind of point number one is he has this quote, and I'm looking over here at my notes for those of you watching on uh, YouTube, but he has this quote um, that says, too often we convince ourselves that massive success requires massive action, but actually it's small pieces of success that add up. Um, I like to talk to my children about this um, as they're taking on new sports and, you know, they're talking about the greatest basketball players of all time, like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Steph Curry. And I say, you know, they started right where you were, but they practiced and it wasn't like they practiced, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, they, you know, but they went out, you know, a couple hours a couple minutes a day and shot that basketball over and over. Every um, basket they shot was that small action that led to massive um, success. And so basically one of the things um, James says in his book is focus on like that 1%, getting 1% better every day. Um, and that really resonated with me. Uh, several years ago, a long time ago, after I had my first son, I wanted to get into running as a form of self-care and exercise. Um, and so when I went out for my first run, it was atrocious. I did not realize how um, unfit I was for running and it was discouraging, but I knew that I didn't want to give up. I was in that place in life after having a, a small child where I was like, I need to invest in me. So my goal, um, when I first ran and I'll, and I'll give myself up here, I could barely run, you know, a quarter of a mile, but my goal at every run was to run a little bit more than I ran the time before. So the next time I may have run a quarter of an, a mile plus two steps. Or sometimes I would do it time-based. If last time I ran 10 minutes, this time I was going to run 10 minutes and 30 seconds. And, um, you know, this this isn't about like stroking my ego, but I, but I will say that in four months time, I went from being able to run three quarters of a mile to seven miles. And it it wasn't by any particular athletic ability or additional training. It was just that mentality of if I run three or four times a week and every time I run a couple minutes more or a couple steps more than I did before, those accumulated and added up to me being able to get to that seven miles. So when James talks about the 1% better, I just, I love that. And really that's a strategy I want all students to take when they're making a change in their lives. And honestly, if you make a change um, that is too unmanageable, then you're likely to quit. You're likely to say, this is so hard, I can't do it. So um, you need to make a change that just challenges you enough and is just within your reach that you can say, hey, I did it. I ran 30 seconds longer or I ran, you know, four steps more than I did last time. And because I did it last time, now I know I can do it next time and the time after that. Um, another big part of the book that, that James talks about 
and that I think is really important to college students is this idea of it's important to set goals. And I know many college students do. I want to get all A's. I want to raise my GPA, those types of things. But really, if you don't have good systems or what I call, he calls them systems. I call them processes, but essentially they mean the same thing. If you don't have good systems or processes in place, then you are not going to reach your goals. And so goals don't achieve themselves. Okay. You achieve the goal, but it's the system that we put in place that gets us to that goal. So for example, let's say you have a goal to, you know, feed yourself better. Well, that's a great goal, but the food isn't just going to, you know, show up (laughs) on your kitchen counter. So you're going to have to put a system or process in place to make sure, you know, you have the food that you need. Maybe you need to put a system in place where you meal prep. Maybe you, you use a food um, ordering system or food delivery system where it delivers you to it to you, but you have to pay attention to the system to see if that system is working for you and getting you to your goal. Um, He has the phrase of, If you fix the inputs, the outputs will fix themselves. What does that mean? If what you're putting in, those are your systems, are, you know, working for you, then you will achieve your goals, okay? And so that's really something I want to emphasize to students is they will say, um, I want to get better grades. That's the goal. That's the output. But we have to evaluate How are you studying? How are you managing your time? What's going on in your life that's competing with your study habits or your time management habits? Those types of things. If you're fixing those things, the grades will fix themselves, okay? And so the other thing he wants, you know, he really emphasizes, which I love, is this idea of contentment and happiness Um, And we often will tell ourselves, oh, if I had higher grades or, you know, oh, if I lifted more in the gym or if I had more friends, I would be happy. Those are all the goals. But he really encourages you to fall in love with the process. If you like the process of going to the gym, if you like the process of food prep, if you like the process of studying then you're more likely to do that process over and over again. And if you're more likely to do it, guess what? You have a better chance of achieving your goals. Um, And he says it, you know, very eloquently that when you fall in love with the process of achieving your goals with those tiny habits, um, rather than the product, which is the goal, you don't have to wait to give yourself permission to be happy. And I I love that because I know a lot of college students um, these days really emphasize how, you know, they don't necessarily like want to grind at the sake of their own mental health or at the sake of their own happiness. And I agree with that. But I will also say that when you love what you do, it doesn't detract from your mental health and your happiness, and it doesn't feel like a grind. So if you can find a way to put systems and processes in place that you feel good about and that you love, then it won't take away anything from your life. And in fact, it will add that contentment and that happiness that you're looking for. Another portion of the book that I love is where he talks about identity. Um, and, And I think this is so important because One of the things, again, when I'm coaching or talking with college students is that they really link their identity to their habits. And I don't think most people understand that how we talk to ourselves about our identity actually is us putting ourselves in a box. And that may not be a bad thing if your identity is positive, like For example, if you're like, I'm a great friend or I'm a great mother, that's, you know, that could be a a really good thing to give yourself permission to, you know, think that about yourself. But some of what I hear from college students are things like, I'm a procrastinator. 
I'm not a motivated person. Um, I don't know how to talk to people, you know, um, or I'm a people pleaser. And so I think about those things and I'm like, they, they are limiting themselves. They can't see how, you know, when you say that to yourself over and over again, that your identity um, will then kind of define your habits. And so um, I wanted to talk about how um, he, uh, James explains it, where he he basically says the ultimate form of intrinsic motivation is when a habit comes from your identity. Intrinsic motivation is motivation that's internal. So extrinsic motivation is like, oh, if I get good grades, my parents will pay me five hundred dollars. That that five hundred dollars is external. It's ex extrinsic. And extrinsic motivators are great. I love them. But a lot of times we don't get a lot of extrinsic motivators. And really, we find out that when people are successful, it's often dri driven by intrinsic motivators. So what James is saying is one of the biggest intrinsic motivators for good habits is when it's attached to your identity and hopefully a positive identity. So I want to use that example of I'm a procrastinator. Well, think about that. If that's what you think about yourself, then when you're sitting around watching Netflix or scrolling on social media, you're doing what's in line with your identity. And even when you start to have even a little bit of an uncomfortable feeling like maybe you shouldn't be doing this, maybe you should be studying, your brain kicks in and says, well, I'm a procrastinator and you know this is what I do. And so you just you go along with it versus what if you said, you know, something maybe a little bit more reasonable, like I like to relax, but I also know how to work hard. Okay. There's a little bit of a difference there. And so another example I want to give is when people are, um, when college students are extrinsically focused, they will say, I want to get an A in this class that the grade at the end is the extrinsic motivation. But if you say, I'm a good student, okay, that doesn't just mean you're you're looking for the outcome in this class. That means one, you're looking for a positive outcome in all your classes, but you're looking to do the things that good students do. And so I, I, I challenge you for a minute to say, is there a difference in habits from someone who would say something like, I'm a procrastinator versus someone who says, I'm a good student. And if you think about that, I'm pretty sure I know I think, yeah, I think of different habits. The person who's maybe a procrastinator has a habit of not starting their work until the last minute or maybe spending too much time relaxing without any structure around that versus the someone who's like, I'm a good student. Maybe that person has habits of like writing in their planner, limiting you know, their relaxation time, starting assignments early. So different habits, different identity. So if you work on changing your habits, you will change your identity. And the, the stronger positive identity you, you have, that's going to in turn circle around and help influence your habits again. So I love the way that James says this. It's a short, simple sentence, but it's profound to me is that every action you take is a vote for the type of person that you wish to become. So let me say that one more time. Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. So when you turn off the YouTube or the social media, to study, you've just voted for yourself, I'm a good student, you know, or you voted against, I'm a pro procrastinator. So I really want to emphasize that our habits, even when in the moment, they don't seem to have a profound outcome, you are collecting votes for the outcome that you want. Um, and so I think that this as James would say, decides the type of person you want to be. Notice he says wants to be. 
again, he's emphasizing that there's no immediate gratification sometimes. It's not the person you are right here and now, but you're getting closer and closer, maybe 1% closer at a time to the type of person you want to be. And he also emphasized that every time you take those small actions, you're proving to yourself with small wins. And I can't emphasize that enough, is that you need to celebrate and give yourself credit for the small wins. If you studied when you didn't want to, that's a small win. If you went to tutoring, even though you were nervous or scared or just felt like hanging out you know, in your apartment or dorm room, that's a small win. Anytime you do or make a small change in behavior, you know, it, if you put your phone on silent and, you know, read your textbook, that's a small win. So I think it's so important that he says that, you know, habits just about, aren't just about like an outcome, like getting a good grade habits, build who you are and how you see yourself. Um, the last tidbit that I'm going to get you, because like I said, I don't want to spoil the book for you. I'm actually, I'm really wanting you to go and read it. Um, it's just this, this basic philosophy that habits are mental shortcuts we develop to solve previous problems. I know, um, one of the things I really appreciate about today's generations of college students is that they are not necessarily into the mindset that you always have to work harder. Um, And, you know, there's that maybe kind of like phrase of working smarter, not harder. I love how, um, you know, today's generations of college students will go to YouTube to watch something to figure things out. They'll share, you know, study guides or flashcards or, you know, those types of things. Um, And so habits, are things that you've developed, maybe even, what's the word, unconsciously to make things easier. Um, I know I have like a habit of throwing in a load of laundry before I go to work. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just doing that so that, you know, I can keep the laundry train moving in my house. Maybe you have certain habits for the way you take notes. Um, and that's your way of solving problems that you had before. So I think sometimes when when you run into a problem that you see repeatedly over and over again, and you feel like you're spinning your wheels or kind of grinding, how do I figure this out? I would say that's when you need to double down and say, obviously, I don't have a good habit in place that has solved this problem. And I need to give this attention so that it, it no longer has to be a problem because every time you have to find a new solution as a um, to a problem, you have to spend precious energy on that, okay? Um, I, I think of the example of, you know, even just like tying our shoes. There are only like one or two ways to tie our shoes, right? Um, there are little, I just went through this page with my kids. There are little rhymes and like methods for doing it. But if there were a hundred different ways to tie your shoes, And every time you went to tie your shoes, you had to try one of those, you know, different ways or learn a different way to tie your shoes. You would spend a lot of time tying your shoes. You would never get out the door. Okay. And so by learning to tie your shoes and developing a quick habit of how you tie your shoes, which may be different than how I do them, you can get your shoes on and get out the door and move on with your day. And the same thing, if you find yourself spinning your wheels about how do I study effectively? How do I make the best study guides? How do I manage my time? And you're just kind of moving along and trying a different pattern every time. That's helpful. But if you don't ever land on a solid way of doing it, you're wasting a lot of time and energy, and you're probably getting very frustrated with yourself. So he talks about developing solid habits as a way to free up more of our energy to devote to the important things in our lives. Um, So that's my teaser for the Atomic Habit books and how I think it really um, applies to college students. Again, um, it's it's an easy read if you wanna pick up a copy and highlight it. But honestly, I don't think I lost anything um, by 
you know, uh, listening to it on audiobook. So if you're a college student and you have some time over break, I would say, you know, put this on your wish list and um, maybe read it. Um, or if you just want something really good to uh, put in your ear pods when you're walking to class or you're on the treadmill or something like that, check it out. Um, I know James has a website. I subscribe to his weekly newsletter. So you can look up and I think it's um, jamesclear.com. He sends great tidbits of information and like a weekly newsletter. So I hope that for those of you listening at this time of year, I know it's finals week at my university. I wish you the best of luck with finals and a very joyful and relaxing holiday break and holiday season. Thanks so much for joining me today for this podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode when it releases. You can help us at Dr. Nari Jeter in the Prosper School by sharing the podcast and leaving a review. It really means so much to know what you think. Also, we want you to hang out with us on your favorite social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. And you'll find all our information and resources on coaching, courses, and the blog at www.thepresperschool.com.